What's up everybody, I'm Kirk, welcome back to the channel. Last week I reviewed Headed, a boomer shooter with the personality of an immersive sim. Set in a wild fantasy world, chock full of high powered weaponry, demon slaying, and thick orc eye candy. I enjoyed it quite a bit, particularly for its smooth blending of genres and focus on narrative. It's not a game for everybody, but it was certainly for me. Now this week we are charging into its sequel, Blood Rite, a beefy follow up with the goal of topping the original in every way. Does it succeed? Well, let's find out. But before all that, if you're new here and you're digging what you're seeing, please consider liking and subscribing to help support this channel. Alrighty, let's head on back. To refresh all of you, Hedden is a shooter built using the Doom engine, more specifically its popular source port, GZ Doom. It began as a passion project by its developer, a man known as Zan, who wanted to create the game of his dreams, an arena shooter incorporating aspects of both RPGs and immersive sims. Initially put out in 2019 as a total conversion mod for Doom 2, Hedden would soon after get a standalone release on Steam, to enthusiastic response, gaining itself a dedicated cult fanbase. Not long after Hedden's release, Zan began working full-time on its follow-up, and in August of 2021, Blood Rite was released. For free. Yes, you heard that right. Free. <laughs> Despite me referring to Blood Rite as a sequel, technically it is an expansion, as it was released as an update within the original Head and Client. Not all that different from the other retro shooters releasing their games in episodic chunks. But once you start playing, it quickly becomes apparent that Blood Rite is its own beast. This is not a piece of a larger whole. This is its own complete experience, far greater in scope and complexity compared to the original. Blood Rite picks up where Crystal Heart left off. Zan, still hot on the trail of the treacherous elf Nithriel, has left her underground home and found herself on the surface world, where the armies of hell are making the lives of the surface dwellers a living hell. It's not long before Zan meets up with the Iron Division stationed on the surface, joining their desperate last ditch effort to quell the plague of demons once and for all. Crystal Heart was refreshing for its emphasis on narrative, and I'm happy to say that Blood Rite carries the torch. Once again, we are treated to classic text interludes, a hell of a lot more documents to sift through, and trippy story sequences that are more action packed this time around. The new storytelling device employed are the briefing sequences, dialogue with NPC characters detailing Zan's quests and the objectives she'll need to complete. Yeah, I suppose the name is self-explanatory. Admittedly, they're not terribly exciting, and sometimes go on a hair too long, but fortunately the player does have the option to skip them. Like the first game, I was fascinated with the lore. Blood Rite puts focus on fleshing out the demons, and I was often surprised by some of the story developments that came from it. Perhaps not all the denizens of hell are as villainous as we think. Overall, the story is a lot of fun, and like the first game, the plot does a great job driving the action of the game, throwing in lots of shakeups and plot twists. I was always eager to see what was next. Graphically, Hedden recycles much of the artwork from the original game, especially in the first half, saving its newer, let's say more vibrant assets for the second half. And while in broad strokes much of Blood Rite looks the same, that doesn't mean there hasn't been improvement. Hmm. Sprites for the newer characters look a lot cleaner compared to the ones from the Crystal Heart, and lighting and fog effects are better implemented, making for a richer atmosphere throughout. Environments were one of my points of criticism in Crystal Heart, in regards to the texturing. Lack of texture variety made many of the environments feel redundant, and some spots just look flat out bland. In Blood Rite, while there are still some textures here and there that don't look great, in general environments look a lot better. Take a look at this area from the Crystal Heart. 
And now take a look at a similar spot in Bloodrite. There's a broader variety of textures lending some nice contrast to help break things up. There's also more geometrical detail to give a better sense of this being a natural organic place. All around, it's a better composition. Contrast in general is something Zan has embraced more in Bloodrite. In the latter parts of the game, Zan uses contrasting colors heavily, making for some really striking environments that artistically were quite satisfying. And level architecture is far more intricate and elaborate. In fact, there were some spots in this game that looked unlike anything I've ever seen in a Doom Engine game. You can tell there was a lot more comfort and confidence that went into the sequel. Bloodrite also retains the original game's excellent attention to sound design as well as its musical stylings, being a mixture of heavy metal and electronic tracks. The electronic tracks once again by way of Alexander Brandon, composer of the original Unreal games. The music is very much the same vibe as the original game, if not a lot more bombastic, which Bloodrite is a lot more bombastic. I really have nothing negative to say about the music. If you dug the tunes in the first game, you're likely gonna dig them here too. Gameplay in Bloodright is largely unchanged from the Crystal Heart. At its core, this is still all about boom shooting, intensive exploration, and puzzle solving, a melting pot of old school first person game design. But in Bloodright's case, the pot got a lot bigger and the cooking heat has been turned up. And while there's not a whole lot new in terms of mechanics, we do have an addition to the arsenal and new enemies to obliterate. Let's start with weapons. This is the Hellclaw. Okay, the Hellclaw was in Crystal Heart, but not prominently, which is why I decided to hold off talking about it until this video, because it was one of my go-tos in Bloodrite. The Hellclaw is basically Hedden's equivalent of the plasma gun from Doom. It shoots out a stream of red-hot orbs, deadly at close range, and may be effective at long ranges if the enemy is on the slow side or if you're just that good. Its alternate fire lobs out proximity mines, for those that take pleasure in an ambush. That's not all. If you run out of ammo, or tap the R key, you can use the Hellclaw as a melee weapon, looking like a back scratcher from hell. The awesome thing about this though is that it will replenish the Claw's ammo pool, which is pretty nifty. For the new weapon, we have the Pain Gun, which might be the most generic name for an FPS weapon I've ever heard. Oh, does the gun cause pain? What a concept. Jokes aside, this weapon is all business. Pain Gun is a minigun, a devastating minigun, able to tear through enemies and reduce them to a pile of goop, which is very satisfying. It's a damn good weapon, perhaps too good. Initially, I was saving it for the tougher enemies, but eventually I was using it against enemies I simply found annoying and wanted to get out of the way. I got so used to doing this that it kind of caused me to ignore my other weapons in favor of it, making some combat scenarios a little easier than what was probably intended. And while Pain Gun does blow through ammo fast, I hardly found myself hurting for ammunition. In fact, parts of the game absolutely shower you with Pain Gun ammo. I suppose that's not a huge deal, plus it ultimately was my choice in combat. But personally, I do feel the gun is introduced too early. With its raw power, I think it would have made more sense if it was brought out in the second half of the game. All that aside, a welcome addition to the arsenal. Next, the new enemies. Some I liked, some I didn't. The new enemies I enjoyed were the Mentalist, Hellions, and Gluttons. Mentalists are a variant on the Initiates, the big difference being their attacks are faster and ignore shields. When they attack, they have more of a wind-up, acting as a tell, but linger too long and you'll get smacked with a pink projectile going lightning speeds. Hellions are half-naked demon babes with their only covering being their ammo belts. Oof, hope they don't run out. These ladies use the pain gun, which makes them extremely dangerous, especially if there's multiple. However, they are easy to kill, and if you keep sprinting, you can outrun their bullets. Gluttons remind me a lot of the Mancubus from Doom 2. They're big, disgusting, pig-like creatures that lob out toxic blobs, like a carpet bomb. And when they die, they explode, which can cause damage if you're in their radius. 
What I like about these new enemies is that they all bring pressure to combat. All of them have attacks that force the player to keep moving and stay alert. Like if you have a glutton on the field and you stay still, he will easily ding you with one of his goo balls, as I learned the hard way. Having them in the mix makes for firefights that feel more frantic and faster compared to the first game. And for an FPS fan who enjoys challenge, they're a great inclusion. <laughs> for new enemies I didn't like, first we have the Genius. These are pesty gargoyle-like enemies that emerge from stone statues. What I dislike about them is that they can easily crowd you, literally getting up in your space. And their sporadic movements can make them hard to hit. I'm sure challenge was the intention, but they end up feeling confusing, janky, and cheap. These are the guys I always use the pain gun on, because I simply didn't want to deal with them. They do have a great death animation though, turning to stone and crumbling on the ground. Last, we have the Psy Demons, who are very intimidating. These Lovecraftian monstrosities can warp around the battlefield, they're resistant to many damage types, like fire, and can create mirror images of themselves to trip up the player. The Cherry Topper is that they have a powerful, and I emphasize, powerful lock-on attack, indicated by this menacing skull that blocks your vision. If it doesn't one-shot you, it will leave you in critical condition. The only way to protect yourself is to take cover and break their line of sight. And that's what I don't like about them. Psy demons force you to stop and take cover, which in an arena shooter is a big no-no. In a crowded battlefield, which all the battlefields are crowded, stopping can be more dangerous than the Psy demons attacks themselves. The other new enemies encourage you to keep moving, not stop. And I'm sorry, but this skull is a poor idea. If you want to indicate the player is about to be attacked, you should do it in a way that doesn't obstruct their vision. To be fair, there is an item called the Psy Crown that can protect you from their attacks, although it has to be charged with soul gems, which can be tricky to find. And surprisingly, the Psy Demons are weak to the axe, so if you have a straight shot at them, this can be the quickest way to take them out. They're a clever enemy, I'll give them that, but their inclusion overall is more frustrating than fun. Finally, we've reached what I think are the best aspects of Bloodrite, its level design and structure. To start, an overall observation I had of this game was its improvement to the design and layouts of combat arenas. In Crystal Heart, arenas were usually on a single plane with lots of space to maneuver, which was perfectly fine and fun. But in Bloodrite, there's a focus on arenas being multi-tiered, more vertical, hearkening to a deathmatch style of level design, complete with the occasional jump pad. And if an arena isn't multi-tiered, it will have a lot more obstacles and cover, likely done to complement the new enemy types. It's a huge improvement that helps every combat situation feel more dynamic, unique, and way more crazy than in the first game. In Crystal Heart, while levels were huge and full of things for the player to do, vibing hard like immersive sim games, the overall game stuck close to the level-by-level -level structure of classic FPS games, complete with a score screen at the end. In Bloodrite, the beginning follows this structure. You blast your way through two sizable, complicated, and most of all, awesome maps with a smattering of puzzles and objectives. But only after completing these do you reach the real meat of the game. A massive open world. Okay, maybe open world isn't the right label, but a very big, non-linear, interconnected map that connects to other big, non-linear, interconnected maps, separated by a brief loading screen. It completely throws out the retro FPS structure in favor of a true, continuous adventure. If this game had a leveling system, it would be a proper action RPG. There's a hub town where you can buy supplies and receive quests, and there's even side quests that can be discovered. And yay, there's now a proper journal to keep track of what you're doing. Plus, there's a teleport fast travel system for convenience. Technically, it is just one big Doom map, but the effect is what matters. 
Hedden wears a lot of influences on its sleeve, but keeping it within the Doom Engine family, the influence of Hexen is easy to see here, as it was in Crystal Heart 2, but Bloodrite reminded me more of Strife. Strife was an action RPG from the mid-90s made within the Doom Engine that was novel for featuring a large interconnected map not unlike Bloodrite's. And I think it's safe to say that Hedden can be considered a spiritual successor to that game. If you're curious about it, I reviewed the Switch version some time ago. Link in the description. To me, this structure is a natural evolution. In fact, there were times during Crystal Heart I wondered why it didn't do something like this to begin with. And the best part about it is that it doesn't sacrifice the core aspects of Hedden. It expands upon them, the exploration and especially the puzzles. <laughs> Oh boy, the puzzles. There's a lot more puzzles in Bloodrite. You still have the fetch and assemble puzzles from the last game, but Xan was not shy about throwing some straight up brain teasers at the player in this one, pushing them even more to closely examine the environment for clues to their solution. Yep, screenshot. I didn't mind the further emphasis on puzzles as I don't mind puzzles in general. In fact, I do enjoy myself the occasional point and click adventure game. But there was one puzzle that did test my patience, actually requiring me to snag a pen and paper to figure it out, like I was playing freaking Mist or something. Once again, I don't mind puzzles, but at the end of the day, this is a shooter. And in shooters, I'm hungry for forward action. And this particular puzzle stops the game dead in its tracks. To be fair, you are given plenty of hints, but those hints have to be written down too. I appreciate the inclusion, but I could have done without it. Alright, so at this point in the video, I'm going to put up a spoiler warning. I'm not necessarily going to spoil anything major in terms of story, and I am going to be very selective in what footage I show from this point on, as to not reveal too much. But I am going to be discussing things that some players might prefer to experience for themselves. So if you don't want blood rights spoiled, even partially, here's your chance to skip ahead. So pretty much everything I just talked about is only Act 1 of the game. It's when you reach Act 2 that Bloodrite goes into that holy shit territory, where you just can't believe someone put so much effort into something they would ultimately release for free. In Act 2, Bloodrite repeats the structure of the first. Yep, you get two gargantuan, spectacle-heavy levels that lead into another giant, open, interconnected map. It's got the hub, the fast travel, and a healthy heap of new quests and side quests, some of which revolving around their own unique, sizable maps. Yeah, man. In fact, I feel Xan could have easily split these two acts into their own separate games or episodes. Eh, maybe with an extra map in each to buff things out. This is not a one-to-one -one comparison, but it kind of brought me back to Castlevania Symphony of the Night, when the second castle drops from the sky and you realize you've only scratched the surface. This second act is the highlight of the whole game, demonstrating some of Zan's most captivating visuals and clever level design. It's astounding, but I do have some criticisms. <laughs> Since the maps are larger and quests more complicated, it is a lot easier to get stuck in this game, especially in Act 2. It was a bit of an issue in the first that is more of an issue in the second. Yes, there is the journal, and it does help, but only so much. Many of the quests have multiple parts to them, and it can still be hard to keep track of where you're supposed to be going and what you're supposed to be doing. I spent a lot more time wandering these maps back and forth totally stuck. This may not be an issue for every player, but for me, it really dragged parts of Bloodrite down. This actually tiptoes me into my larger criticism of the game. There was a point in the late game where I just plain hit a wall and was ready for Bloodrite to end. Not that what I was playing was bad or anything. Like I said, Act 2 is the highlight. But keep in mind, the core loop of Hedden is shoot, explore, and collect which is fun, but at some point it does start to lose its luster. See, Crystal Heart, while it had its moments of drag, was a well-paced game. It was a nice, tight experience that to me was the perfect length. For Bloodrite though, in the effort to expand the scope and pack so much more into it, I felt the pacing really started to suffer, and the game began to overstay its welcome. 
You know that third ending in Return of the King type of feeling. Now I'm gonna be upfront and say for this review, I went straight from Crystal Heart into Bloodrite with nary a break. And there's a good chance my feelings here are related to that. If that's the case, take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. And yes, I do feel a little guilty throwing any sort of complaint at something that was released for free. But I do think it's a valid critique to say that Bloodrite either needed to cut something or, and this would be my preference, find a way to evolve the core loop in Act 2. Find some sort of new concept for the player to sink their teeth into. Whether it be a new mechanic or maybe some type of meta aspect to the game. Something to re-engage the player beyond just more shooting and puzzle solving. Cause it does start to feel pretty old in the late game. To reiterate, I think Act 2 is amazing, above and beyond in many ways. But if Zan continues with a head in 3, I feel like this is something he should keep in mind. Overall, I don't think Bloodrite is as tight and clean an experience as Crystal Heart. I definitely had some gripes with the new enemies and the overall game length and pacing. But at the end of the day, this is still a fantastic sequel. Another feat within the Doom Engine, dripping with fun and creativity. If you love the first Hedden, you'll love this one too. For me, Hedden in its entirety is a great example of what makes this retro shooter revival so great. It's not just the nostalgia, it's seeing newer developers take established, classic gameplay styles and striving to do something new with them, taking a chance with experimentation, or expanding on concepts that developers of the past had difficulty getting past the gatekeepers. From here, I'm eager to see what Zan does next, whether it be Hedden 3 or something else. I know I'll be there day one. But that's it for me today. What were your thoughts on Bloodrite? And what sorts of things would you like to see in a potential head in 3? Let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to subscribe, like, and ring the bell for notifications on future uploads. It's a couple clicks for you and a massive help for this channel. And don't be shy, come say hi in the Kirk Collects Discord linked below. I'm Kirk, and thank you for watching this video. Stay safe out there.